All right, Kevin, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, we have you on the podcast. We're excited to have you on the webinar. How are you doing? I'm great. And I think before we get into it, I just want to say, um, you know, I think what you're doing is great. I love the narrative that you're pushing, to be honest. So thank you. No worries. No worries. Um, we have, you know, we, we kind of threw around a couple of ideas on social media, just back and forth on messages. We're going to keep this kind of on a, on a blank canvas, so to speak. And I'm going to um, pretty organic chat. Emotional literacy is something that uh, when I saw it, I'm like, right, I don't know a lot about that there. So that's where I want to go with this conversation. Uh, I know you've done, oh, I mean, if, like follow you on Instagram. You're, you're up to 100 different things every week. Um, I feel like the laziest person in the world when I look at your thing because I'm not doing anything compared to what you're doing. So, I mean, talk to me about um, emotional literacy in terms of, I suppose, players, young players and then coaches as well. Okay, so I mean, first of all, focusing on what it is, it's knowing and understanding your feelings. It's also the skill of empathy. So once you know and understand your feelings, about it's about being able to almost transport yourself into that person's shoes and seeing where they're coming from and understanding them as well. Then it's looking at how to repair emotional problems and manage the problems, right? So that is emotional literacy. In terms of coaches and players, the reason why it's so important is because you're going into a space where there's so much pressure. When you look at it as a, as a player, you're being judged by yourself. You're being judged by your teammates. Okay, so oh, you're good, especially young players. Oh, he's good, or he's not that good, or he's the best. So they create this hierarchy, and that hierarchy is so important because what that does, is that entails of how much they trust you. And we see that in terms of when they play on the pitch. I'm, I'm going to give it to you because in a way you're going to save us. Um, and also how they direct banter and, and the levels and what they say. This is also repeated in the relationship with the coach because again, it's like, okay, am I gonna play? Am I gonna play my position? Does the coach trust me in that? So there's all these things. And I think when it's unstable, when the player is unaware of actually what they're making up, because you know what it's like, when we get in our feelings, we start to create all these things that are going on that actually aren't true. And then we start to say, oh, well, this person thinks this and it's not actually true. Um, and it's the same with the coach, but I think from the coach perspective, sometimes they get lost in judgment. And I always use the example where I've had a lot of friends and I've seen other players ruin their career. So what can happen is uh, a coach will set up shadow play. A player may go into a team, look at the other team and think, oh, hold a minute, those guys are probably in the starting team. I'm not starting. So now you go insert um, bad body language, insert negative attitude. Um, insert lack of effort and then the coach is on the sideline thinking you know what's wrong with him bad attitude and so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so then that player then gets dropped and gets released so from the perspective of the player the player believes that they were right because it became self-fulfilling prophecy they then go somewhere else now because in football there's not really much communication going on nothing of no conversation around this has happened so they go into another club similar situation repeats itself and they do the same but actually before it even gets to that what they do is they say okay i'm going to take control and so i've had friends in the past where they get into arguments with these managers and i will say but hold on but you're the problem here because you've had this with all these different managers now obviously they was not be able, they were not able to articulate themselves and at the time i wasn't but what i realized is that they were basically saying i don't want to be a victim anymore i'm not going to let you drop me but i'm going to drop myself you know, so when I look at these issues, and as you know, my work's not just in football. Is is I use I use football in other spaces like schools and prisons. But when you look at why young people get kicked out of school, when you look at why people in prison, when you look at why people get released or don't fulfil their potential, the foundation is emotions. In in every story, I can literally pluck it out, and that's what I did in psychology when I wrote the book. That's what I was trying to highlight to people. Okay. Well, look at this story. Look at this story. That's from this generation. That's from that generation. You know, um, that's from that club. That's from that country. No matter what, that's the foundation. Do you think, I had this conversation with uh, last night. Do you think that, you know, we've chatted before in the podcast and talked about your background as a player coming up through the, the traditional academy system where it was aggressive coaching. But now do you think because we've, quite rightly got rid of a lot of bullying, a lot of this aggressiveness. Have we replaced it with, and you said there, not a lot of communication. So it's it's passive aggression. 
which is a tough, tough thing for a young player. They could tell that self-fulfilling prophecy is amazing because then they start, they create a different narrative based off the fact of the coach not speaking to them. So what I'm asking, is it almost more difficult, you think, for a player to deal with no communication than what it was with dealing with aggressive communication? Well, I mean, there's always been no communication. So even though we had the, the, the aggressive communication in the past, it was more about a judgment. So the coach had already taken a position of, I'm right and you're wrong. Mm. So it's like, you've got an attitude, no, 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 whatever it is. But there was no inquiry in terms of what's going on for the player. I think nowadays there's less aggression, even though it's still there, but there's still no communication. And But I think the good thing about now is that I think that the the, um, the coaches have more a better intention in terms of player well-being. They do. Um, and when I speak to the coaches networks that I work with, they, I say to them, when you speak to a player, you know, you can say to them, oh, you can speak to me or how are you? Um, but it's really difficult because they're coming from a space where they, they don't have these conversations at home. You know, you don't develop emotional literacy in school. And what they do is, is what we all do. So what will happen is, is they will observe you outside of that question. So they will look at how you interact with other players. They'll look at how you interact with other people. And then obviously it's how you manage them. So some coaches might say, but I, oh, I say they can come and speak to me. But actually, it's, it's about your behavior on the whole. How open are you? And I think that's what's really important. So when we go to communication, it's like, okay, first of all, you have to create the environment. You are the environment. That's the first part. Then the space that you create, because amongst your players, how you impact them, that creates its own ecosystem. And then secondly, we look at, um, like, in terms of yourself as a coach, because I find a lot of the times the coach say, okay, I want to do this for the players, I want to develop players. And a lot of the times say, don't worry about the players, they'll be fine. Worry about yourself. So if you develop yourself, then they are going to be a product of you, you know, and that's what's so important is you develop yourself and you won't even need to think about stuff because it's natural. You know, if you start to um, do self-reflection, improve your communication, look at how you can re be representative of the environment you want to create. All these things about you, the environment that you, you create for those players is a byproduct of your self-development. Yeah, well, this is interesting. So, again, another conversation I had yesterday was about uh, a coach highlighted another coach who said that uh, they really respected Coach X because they walk their walk, they 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 post pictures of workout, their their diet, their they look as if they're you know doing everything they want their players to do. Uh, so when the physical aspect and it's a coach working out and doing all that, it's a bit easier because it's so. How can a coach then uh, walk their talk from a psychological standpoint? Um, so, first of all, it's interesting what you said about the physical aspect because I remember having coaches when I was at Charlton and uh, they would tell us to do things, but they couldn't really do it. But then I had um, Mark Robson who took over, who was a former player, and he was unbelievable. He would join in training and absolutely embarrass people. So he got a level of respect and he had the personality. He was brilliant. But, um, but from a psychological aspect, what I would say is, and it's interesting, I don't even, I mean, I think sometimes we can complicate things. I don't want to come on here as like this mental health or psychological expert, because I think sometimes we make it seem as though it's so far removed from us. But in terms of a humanistic point of view, what I always say is give part of yourself to the player. So what I mean by that is, is you, no matter what standard you've played at as a coach, you've played. And it'll be great if you can share your experiences emotionally. So say, for example, you know, um, I remember when I was flying and these were the reasons why. But actually, when when these things weren't happening for me, you know, I lost confidence. And to be honest, I was playing terribly and it affected me this way because indirectly you're giving them permission to have the conversation. So it goes back to what I was saying before. When you say, oh, you can talk. No, it's the other elements. When you open up and share yourself, you then give permission for them to share. So I think that's one element. I think other examples would be literally in terms of feedback and how you give feedback. So it's looking at how you can spread it, um, but also making sure it's genuine. So if you're someone who says well done to everyone, it gets taken with a pinch of salt. But if, if someone's really struggling, it's highlighting the things they're doing well, but then also saying, look, I see that you're struggling with X, Y, and Z, but I'm here for you. I'm going to work with you on this. And so you, even though you're managing a team, you have that personal relationship with each one. And I think that's so powerful. So it's like, okay, you're sharing your vulnerabilities 
and you're adhering to the individual. And I think that's so powerful. You're acknowledging the good stuff, you're acknowledging the bad. I, I think sometimes we kind of get roped into this, um, you know, in life, you know, be happy and focus on the happy, but that's not reflective of life. Life is good and bad. Mm -hmm. I, I see that, um, it's there, okay, you know, let's, what should we do? Involve them in the conversation and look at, and pay attention to how you speak because Again, we have this this uh, natural innate um, response to want to save people, but what when we do that, we actually don't listen and we we take them out of the situation. So, if I see a young player struggling, I might say, "Look, um, you know, I see this. Let's do that." But actually, that person could feel something completely different, and I've now taken over. So, I would I could acknowledge what I see and say, "Look, this is what I see." You know, I'm curious to know if that's what you think and feel. Then they can respond. If they say yes or no, then, okay, so what is it? Talk to me about that. Okay, then they start to share. Okay, so how do you think we can go about this? They are leading. And just, just by doing that, you are empowering them. Mm. But I think if we start to drive stuff, then you're taking them out of the process. So um, I know I've said quite a lot there, but, you know, obviously people can rewind it once it goes out, etc. Yeah, no, it's very, very good. Uh, you mentioned there, like, that, that open door policy and i had uh, that that's been i've done that and i've had uh, donna fister come in um and i said the same thing you know she's like well let's look at these processes you have in place and i said yes tip box tick open door policy don't worry about it and she's like how many people come in and i'm like none <laughs> uh and and then it's the structure so i i suppose what i'm trying to ask is should we as coaches you said there don't base it on our, our on our like base it on our processes almost like these conversations these informal should we be spending a bit more time i suppose a starting point should be we working maybe 15 20 minutes before a session or maybe walking off with someone or i suppose where would you put those um changing what you do the most all right so i would say this so when i spoke to michael bill when i was writing psychology he said something really interesting he said um what he done is they had quite a big squad. So they divided the squad up in Liverpool where the players didn't know this, but the coaches took, say, seven or eight players each. And what they will do is, when they're walking from the building to the training ground, they'll just have short conversations. So it's so natural and organic. And they'll say, oh, how's, you know, how's this? Oh, how's that? And, and Michael has in his head, he said, look, if I have a conversation for two minutes, say, oh, how's, how's the family, whatever? We are naturally programmed to say, oh, yeah, fine. So he would also say, look, he would aim to have, like, say, a 10-minute conversation with a player. And I think that's really powerful. So I wouldn't say to put more stress on yourself as a coach. I would say, look, how can you make it organic? So that is just one scenario from the from the, the building to the pitch. There'll be other times where you'd be able to have that conversation. So that's good, natural organic, but also it's really, really important. There's going to be times where you should call out. In, in therapy, we call it um, naming. So if you notice something, it's really important that you name it. That means the player doesn't have to deal with it now. So, for example, Gary, if you're coaching a player and you notice there's a massive change in this player, you could pull them one day and say, look, um, I noticed that, you know, you, you, you seem down, you know, your energy's low, you know, performances um, don't seem at the, high, the level you were hitting before. Is there something going on? Now, that player might say no, even though you know something's going on, but it's fine. Do you know why? Because you find that seed. When they are ready, they will come to you. You know, so those are the things. So it's like, okay, we've got Billsy's example, but we've also got the part where, okay, you can see something, pull them, let them know, and then when they're ready, they will come to you. Or they might not come to you. They might even go to somebody else, but you brought it out instead of them trying to bury it. Mm. Do you know what's funny? Uh, when you talk about Michael B, I went and observed him at Liverpool three, four years ago. Um, mm. And, I, like, he's so generous with his time. He kept me waiting. He walked, gave me the session plan, walked off after the training session, sat in his office and said, hey, Gary, can you sit here for 20 minutes? And yeah, of course, no problem. And he said, I've got to go and speak to, and he named the player who was really bad at session that day. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, oh, brilliant, I'm going to see. Like, and he only told, like, for two minutes, he just told me why he was having the conversation. And he was saying he's having a tough time. He's away from home, but they were all external factors. There wasn't one technical point that he was annoyed about. So it's it's really really interesting that that's you know a, an emotionally aware coach I suppose at, at a high high level sees that and then associates performance with 
lifestyle and and all these other things and um i suppose for us to get to that level then what what would advice would you have for us at youth pro whatever well so the thing is with bilzy he's he got to that level because of um Mourinho, to be honest was a big influence on him and um Oh, what's the guy's name at Liverpool again? The academy director. Uh, Alex Inglethorpe. So they are literally open to doing all these co um, live coaching pro coaching programs, all this other stuff. So they're just very open. So if I was to advise a coach and say, okay, um, what could you do? First of all, I would say read um, biographies of players, but good ones. For example, you've got the David Beckham biographies, which are safe, that you learn nothing from. <laughs> <laughs> or you can read Dennis Bergkamp's one, which is if you, and it's really important that you read below the line. So what I mean by that is Dennis Bergkamp's book for me is translated as a story of beliefs and values. So being brought up in a club and a country, which is probably seen as the most attacking in the world. Um, then moving to Inter Milan, which is the complete opposite of contrast. So the, the mere relationship was conflict. Then you had the relationship of conflict with the coaches because at this time, Inter were trying to replicate what AC Milan had done with um, what Arrigo Sarchi had done. But the difference was is that Inter coaches were trying to do it just by signing some Dutch players. They didn't really take on the methods. So as a coach, I think that book is invaluable. You know, and I can name some more. I also read books outside of football. And then obviously there's the, that's the reason why I wrote Psychology because I, I thought there was nothing out there you know, the body of work for football. Um, in terms of courses, and this is really tough because, I mean, my before I went into doing my official therapy counselling courses, I did NLP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was really fortunate. My teachers were out of this world. They're my mentors to this day. I go back and do helping. I volunteer for free because I'm still learning from them. They are unbelievable. So on one hand, I would say NLP. But on the other hand, there are so many cowboys out there. They will actually get literally the basic certificate and say they're a trainer and train. So you have to be very vigilant in terms of where you go, you know. So um, and then I would say, and I think if there was one thing I'd say to you, I would say study a psychology course. I'm looking to do neuropsychology because I'm a qualified counsellor. I'm not a psychologist. I think because of the book, people thought I was a, a psychologist. But I would say if you really want to throw yourself in and just not be all kind of all over the place doing stuff, I would say look at psychology. Definitely not sports psychology, psychology. Brilliant. Do you think, uh, I know we, we spoke just before you told me about the, the Roma players, do you think that we are almost at a stage where the player, you know, you've got these players, I know LeBron spends X amount in, in terms of the, the support he has around him to get his body right. Do you think we're at a stage where players are going to start looking outside clubs and start to basically work with specialists in the, in the mental side? I don't know if you're doing it already, but on a bigger scale? Well, yeah, I mean, it goes again, it goes back to my book. So um, Fabian Delft, he said when it was at City, the players used the psychologist there, but he said, and they, and they really liked the psychologist there, but however, he went outside. Mm. Um, I think there's this trust um, factor there with the clubs. So Danny, um, Danny Guthrie, same, he, he's, he looked um, for support outside of the clubs, you know? So I think when you get to a certain level, you can afford it. Um, I think players will go outside. Um, but on the other hand, I think sometimes because players are blind to their own stuff, they might be inclined, they're kind of forced to go and see the psychologist so they will go to the club, you know? I mean, Marcus Bent was talking on an Instagram live with David Cottrell the other day where he checked into um, the rehab sporting chance. But that was more because of his wife basically said, you need to go, basically you've got some issues. So um, yeah, in, in short, I think players will, I think they will seek their own support, to be honest. How do they get that trust? How does a uh, sports psychologist, and I hate using the word sports psychologist, but how does, how does someone who's working on that mental side of the game get the level of trust to, to start chipping away at things? It, it comes from all different um, angles, to be honest. Just the fact of being a person who's nothing to do with a football club, um, talking to them, they, they feel they can trust you because you're almost detached. And that's yeah. why a lot of people sometimes think, oh, you know, you need to know the game or you need to relate. 
people don't really like that. There's a lot of people who don't like that. They think, oh, actually, you're too connected to the game. So no. Um, but on the other hand, some people obviously think, no, you know, this person gets me. They understand. So that's one aspect. But again, when I spoke about the, from the coaches earning trust, it's the same thing with the, the therapist or psychologist. It's like, OK, we are trained to have conversations where we are there to facilitate the environment. So it's not about us saying, oh, you're coming to see us. We can help. And then all of a sudden we're, we're interjecting or we're, we're asking questions. I mean, we can ask questions, but it's about facilitating that conversation to help the player talk and figure things out on their own. And because of that, what happens? You end up building the trust because you take the player into a space that they're not used to. Because naturally, when we interact daily, people are so, um, how, can I, how can I say this? Linguistically, they're overlapping each other. You know, sometimes people literally interject so they can get their point across and the other person waits and they interject. And so when you go into this different environment, consciously, you don't know what it is. But you're like, oh, wow, this is brilliant. And that's why you get a lot of um, clients who actually end up fancying their therapist. <laughs> you know? Seriously, seriously, it's actually a really big thing because you know what it is? A aside from the skills, it's the le it's intimacy. Mm -hmm. And that's why, um, I don't know if you guys have it, you, you, you know we have dancing on ice, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Over here we call it the curse or something because apparently a lot of people that go on that show actually end up dating the dancer and the, you know, step up from their partner. But you're in that intimate space um, and it's it's a it's a full space like therapy. It's, it's not a real space, mm. and there's something about you where that person's making you priority. When you go into therapy, you're the priority. Mm. When you go into the night, you're that professional who's literally dedicating all their time, all their attention to you. You know, so and yeah. I love those people. Is that what you're saying? That once someone gives us that priority, we're like, oh, we're all about it. Yeah, because that's what we we all love attention, don't we? We all love it. <laughs> We love it and um, we love it just because for our ego, but we also need it for nurture and development. And this is why a lot of children I work with when I'm in a school or even when I work with adults in prison, it's amazing what neglect and abandonment can bring and what it can drive people to, you know. So, yeah, like we got warned about it. It was like when you were trained, it was like, listen, you're going to have clients are going to be frying themselves at you. <laughs> That's what I'll have for you, and then we'll, we'll bring in some questions. So, you know, a lot of coaches. You know, we've seen it on social media that have, you know, they've given players the technical workouts and then I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of physical work going on where, where some coaches that are disconnected with their team at the minute, what are some ways they maybe plant the seeds of emotional literacy or the mental side of it that maybe do some work uh, before they, they all reconnect? Do you know what I would say for a coach is just check in with players, see how they are, see how the family are, but then also just have chit chat. That's it, you know, just no, no talk about football because it just shows you care about who they are. I, I think that's probably the easiest thing. So you, you don't have to overthink things. And, and I, I think for the players and how they see you, it will be completely different. I think at the moment, you know, I see a lot of things about, you know, being active, which is great and it's important and giving the tactics. But, you know, even my story, I always say this. When I was at Charlton, there was one time where I was probably one of the I wasn't one of the main players in the team, even though I was needed because of what I brought, but I felt terrible. But within a year, I was the best player. That wasn't anything to do with my development. That was because I had an attitude of not, I had an attitude of not caring. You couldn't see it externally, but internally. And what I, the reason why I bring that up is because I developed that through frustration and kind of hitting a wall. But actually, if I had a coach who could see that and bring it out within me, he could have done that a lot earlier, you know? So the value is like, yes, we need to develop the technical aspect. It's so important. But it comes to a stage where it's like, okay, for me to extend past that, I need someone who can bring that out within me. Um, and I think this moment during the lockdown, just getting to know your players, having that relationship could be so powerful. I mean, just one more point to add to that, Gary. Like, If you look at your team physically, pretty much they probably all can do the same thing right physically so then what is the difference it's the decisions they make and their decisions that they make is governed by how they feel right so actually first of all we should be prioritizing that connection we have with them so then we can help facilitate that you know it's a given yeah brilliant brilliant um okay if you just want to put some questions in i'll start taking them no um i don't think there's any real there's a lot of comments uh, a lot of great positive comments. There's no real questions. Um, I don't 
Uh, one another thing I want to ask you, just when we're, when we're waiting on them to come in, um, the aspect of do you think anything is going to change in terms of what we're going through, COVID nineteen? You know, the isolation. Whenever you get back with teams, do you see any issues that people will need to address? Do you see any positives coming that you think that's going to twist or trend in a certain direction? In terms of coaching, it's quite difficult. I think what. I think there's going to be a negative. Players are going to be more anxious, mm. pressures from families, because now you're going out to train and you're going to make us, yourself and us vulnerable. That's what's going to happen from the family. So I think it's going to be negative. I can't think of um, anything positive. Because one thing, I, I, one thing actually I would say is that is encourage people to, to do extra learning. People have taken this opportunity not only to deliver, but also to actually say, I want to go and develop further. You know, I'm going to go and study more. So I'm hoping that could um, that can expand. Then I've actually looked at the chat. I don't know if you want me to. I know some people have asked about book recommendations. Do you yeah, want me to? Yeah. Talk more? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So more book recommendation. I would say um, Mike Tyson's book. I thought was brilliant because what it does, it how I saw it is his his childhood was brought up. Um, it was based upon violence, abandonment, heavily sexualized. And so he sought love from the streets. Mike, Mike Tyson was taking drugs, coke by 10, breaking into houses at 11. And what I thought was so powerful and why I did I put this bit in the book is because I know a lot of footballers who had similar lifestyles. And then boxing not only changed his life around, but when he met his coach, because of the relationship he had with his coach, he gave him the belief that he could be more than what he was. And his, his self-esteem was so low. Um, so what was interesting, and it's quite sad, is that because of Customato, he went like that. But when Cus died, he went like that. So what Cus represented for me was their perfect example of attachment. So we see these interviews of Mike Tyson when he literally goes off the rails, and everyone's like, oh, Mike Tyson, he's this or he's that. But before that, he wasn't like that at all. So I think that's a great story for the players, especially who come from tough backgrounds. Um I think Outliers is brilliant, a brilliant book about behavior in general and understanding um, high levels of performance and, and changing people based upon their circumstances and environment. Every chapter is different. Blink by Malcolm Gladwell as well is brilliant. It's about unconscious behavior. So for a footballer, if I give you an example of a, um, how we develop as people. So, you know, when we're a baby, I always use an example, we stand up, our heads down, our focus is in our space. We need to literally manage all our muscles to stand up. Then we hear our parents high five and go, hey, look, he's standing up. And because of that, our attention goes and we fall, we drop. Now, when we go into adulthood, same thing, we learn to drive. Steering wheel, heads in the car, okay, clutch, whatever. As we develop more, the, the head, our mind goes to the bonnet. Now we can see traffic and we can avoid it. Same in football, basics, we start to learn to pass. We develop more, we can do more, do skills. And then when you get to a certain level, the ball's zoomed into you and you're not even looking at it. You're now positioning your body and constructing an image of what you're going to do next. So you might do it first time or you might bring it down. So unconscious competence, again, as you know in psychology, is so important and blink is brilliant. And it's really important to be keen to learn outside of football because then once you learn about that, when you go into football, like it will just be at another level. I think sometimes what we don't want to do is be bogged down in the content of football because that again, just like you and your team, once you develop yourself, your coaching methods and everything else will just develop. Um, I'm literally trying to look at my my book um, my bookshelf now as I speak to you. <laughs> is that the Mike Tyson Undisputed Truth? Is that that book? Yeah. That's brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, I actually saw him. Uh, I saw the interview with Dennis Rodman that he did for his podcast, and he. He actually referenced how D'Amato shaped him into only worrying about himself. And it's funny that you would think a coach wouldn't have, but of course, like it makes sense and, and how many issues that caused down the road. Well, yeah, but the, the thing is, I, I mean, I got brought up to think about the team, all right? But when you look at the best players in the world, they don't do that. Mm. And you don't make it, when you come from an academy, you don't make it as a team. You make it as an individual. And I, when I speak to young players, I always say this, if I could go back right now, I wish I was more selfish because I realized that actually, as long as I did my job, I'm working for the team. So if I'm playing centre mid, I'm tracking my runner, I'm doing all the defensive duties that's required of me, and I'm doing the work that required going forward because I was box to box. 
I'm working for the team. But I think because this narrative gets pushed, what I ended up doing, I was not only doing my duty, I ended up doing excess for the team. Yeah, yeah. And so when I, I remember being at West Ham, so at this time I was a striker when I was a bit younger. And when Jermaine Defoe would score and we, and we had lost, he'd be content. But if he didn't score and we had won, sorry, he'll be happy. But if, we, if he didn't score and we'd won, he'd be content. Now, Harry Redknapp was the gaffer at the time, right? When we was in the academy. And um, he would come over, watch us train. He'd engage. He was brilliant. And he would ask Tony Carr, the academy director, oh, how did they get on? Who scored? So, and the reason why I'm saying this is because a lot of the time, if Harry Redknapp's asking who scored, it's going to be Jermaine. It's not going to be about the work that I'm doing. You, you know, don't get me wrong. Tony might tell, yeah, you know, Kev worked hard. But if you're going to keep hearing Jermaine about, hold on a minute. So I, I, I believe in the team aspect, but you have to do your, your work. And that's why Ronaldo is amazing. That's why Messi is amazing. Because sometimes you could do it so good that the team then evolves around you, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go through some of the other questions because I can talk about that all day. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, we'll, start with, we'll start with James. Uh, okay. Do you agree that coaches, well, I often read biographies that talk about a hierarchy within a squad and coaches treat players differently because of this hierarchy. Uh, I know that's that's a really big thing in America. Do you think coaches should adopt this approach or should there be a separate approach? There will always be a hierarchy because it just happens generally in life. We Everyone does it. We do it socially. What I would say for the players, um, I'm trying to think actually from a coach's perspective, if I was coaching, what would I do? It's difficult for you not to do that, but I would actually speak to the players to empower them. So when I work with players, I always say, look, there is a hierarchy um, and it's an elite sport, so you're going to get pressure. There's going to be, um, if you're in a club, for example, there's going to be ones that there's placed more value upon. You have a choice. You can either let it affect you or you can realise that this is the system that I'm in. Um, how can I best adapt to this system? So how can I make sure that I push myself up that hierarchy? Because if you're not in the team, it's the same approach. I'm not in the team. What am I going to do? Moan about the coach? Or actually, I need to perform harder so he cannot drop me, even though I don't agree with him or her. I need to do more, you know? So I, I, I think that's what I would do. I would speak to the players and let them know, look, I'm not always going to be right. This is what I think is best, and it might not be right. But you could actually change my mind if I do something that you feel is wrong, you know, and push yourself up higher. Lewis has asked, how can you create emotional connections with players who are highly resistant or guarded? That's a challenge. That's a challenge, and it can take time. Um, if you're if you're working for a club who's got a therapist, I would definitely say, you know, you can one, assign the player to them or you can ask them for tips. My one would be this. The ones that are highly guarded, let's say they've got a lot going on, pay attention and it's going to be a long process. So, for example, I remember working in a school with a boy, funny enough, who was at a pro club and he came to see me Um and he, he had a referral. And, and this is, it goes back to what I was saying. People might think, you know, this boy was black. So they might think, oh, Kevin's a man. There's not many therapists who are men. And he's a black guy. This guy might be able to connect with him. But what he done, I call it, he ladded me. So he probably thought, oh, yeah, Kevin's a lad, like whatever. So he was having like chit chat with me. Um, and I, I asked certain questions, but he, he kind of avoided it. So the second session, I said, look, you, I do know why you've been referred. Now, I didn't go into the detail, but I touched on it. And when I did that, you could see that he became a bit flustered and he was he kept fidgeting with his hand. Mm. So what that told me is that he just wasn't ready yet. And, and for some people, it could take a whole year. You know, they might even take themselves out of the therapy and then later when they're ready, come back. So for the coach, it could be a case of, you know, that person's really guarded. What I need to do is I need to create a situation, an environment where when they're ready, they can come to me. But during that time, they know I'm aware um, and it's just about making a space that's safe for them. And that's it. Obviously, you've got to do that whilst taking into consideration the team, as long as they're not being disruptive, because then there's going to be other ways that you're going to have to manage that. Mm. But this is why I believe that therapy, there should be therapy um, elements as part of the syllabus when doing, be qualified to be a teacher or a coach. Mm. Yeah, similar along those lines, Jack has asked, you know, in your first interaction with a player, how does that look? How do you set that foundation? Does that change for every player based on the setting? The first interactions. So just to give you an example. So obviously, as you know, I've started this e-school. So I'm working with this team. And my first um, session was about talking about myself, how I set up psychology. But then after that, 
it was, I said to them, this is your program. I said, I've created a, a plan of what I'm going to do. I said, it's for you to tell me what's working, what's not. Because I said, I don't want to speak at you. I don't want to do this for you because it, it, you won't enjoy it. Um, and so then I've told them that. And then throughout, I do different ways of checking in. So that because even though I've told them, I need to now let them see that it's real. So as a coach, if I look at it like the season's going to start, I'll do the same thing. Okay, we get together. Guys, this is how I plan to play, guys or girls. This is how I plan to play the season. And I'll create a safe environment. If you're not in the team, this is how I'm going to go about it. And this is really important. Even like dropping players, it could be so much. Because what sometimes coaches might not realise is that they could take the drop, being dropped as a rejection. And that rejection could be linked, believe it or not, to dad rejecting them and going and starting another family. So you're thinking, oh, they've got a terrible attitude, not knowing the impact. So when you say to them, okay, this is a structure. When I when I drop a player, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak to you guys on Friday. Just say, you know, on the Friday. Um, so what happens now is they're aware of every step of the process. Um, you know, I'm open to feedback. This is what we're going to do. So now I've pre-framed it. Now when we start working with each other, how am I going to show that? How did you think training was? Blah, 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 blah. Um, if they're not that receptive, I'll give it a, you know, a period of time. I will then create forms which have no names. It's just blank. And they can give me their feedback because now they're not worried about potentially being dropped or protecting my feelings. That's what they might do. Um, and this is where coaches have to make themselves vulnerable because we ask players to do it. And you might get some real criticism there. And it's, are you willing to be open yourself up to it, take it on and deal with it? And I think if you do that, I think players will be like, wow, OK, this is this is real. And especially if you're implementing that or speaking to them, because they'll realize, OK, you are really about what you say. Brilliant. Uh, Sonny has asked, Kevin, you also talk in your book about arrogance and it's probably valuable because it helps you deal with pressure. Any comments on the concept of arrogance? Yeah, so I got brought up with, uh, and people do it now, oh, you know, this person's humble. That person, mm. just thought, oh, we overdo it. it. It doesn't make sense. I mean, we talk about being humble and then we look at Ronaldo and Michael Jordan and we're like, wow, you know, Jermaine, Jermaine Defoe again, he had that football arrogance, you know. And, and when I had the attitude internally of I don't care, I kind of developed it. And I, and the best way for me to describe it, it was at like a shield. So that means any level of insecurity, anything that can come to me, any comments, whatever it is, it just bounced off. And I was bulletproof. But also um, so that it didn't affect my performance. So in terms of arrogance, I think you need a balance. So when I look at it, for me, I was too humble and I needed that. And I think there are players who have it at a good level. So Sancho's got it, Foden's got it. I can link name others. Uh, but then you can look at someone like Cassano, who's got too much of it, Antonio Cassano. And that's why he's played at so many different clubs. Um, but he's played at so many top ones because he's got a talent. But when we look at his state, it's, it's questionable. But when you look at his childhood, there are some things that aren't explained that. And you see that with other players. So I would say definitely with arrogance, it's about, OK, how can I take this on? internally and not externally so that it affects other people and their judgment of me that's really important in understanding what that is yeah you mentioned michael jordan there what have you made of the i mean it's an amazing piece of work this documentary what have you thought of it i absolutely love it right so and it's funny so first of all um what i love about the documentary is highlighted um first of all michael jordan i think we love him because he's been amazing. However, I there's a question mark for me is what about the players who didn't survive at the balls? Because his strategy was about basically seeing if you're up to it, and it could be seen as a bit of a bully. But because of his success, we're like, yeah, it's great. But actually, in the workspace, it's not great if you weren't up for it. So there's it's not black and white for me. Um, but I love the doc. Um, I'm behind in a few episodes, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enjoy it and I'm gonna go back and decipher it. One of the things that stood out was Dennis Rodman because grew up, uh, mum kicked him out of the house, you know, some, uh, traumatic experience growing up. He literally rejected. Then he goes to play for balls. Dad doesn't contact him. He's got loads of siblings. Dad writes a book about him, makes loads of money about him, right? So now his self-worth is extremely low. When Pippin's injured and out of the team, he gets in the team. He doesn't perform because he, he, he wasn't someone who grew up loving basketball in terms of, okay, I want to make it. He just did it as it was, um, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? It was containment. This is why a lot of people go to football. It provides structure. It, pro it provides consistency. 
Now, what I love is there was a game when he let Michael Jordan and the team down and he went to Michael Jordan's room and asked for a cigar. And Michael Jordan said that was his apology. This is important because a lot of people cannot, they don't connect with their emotions and they find it difficult to actually um, express how they feel. So Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan were very open and I thought this was brilliant. Now, when they had a conversation about it in terms of he, um, indirectly it was like, look, we need you. That is, he felt, his self-worth went up. You know, he's not actually said it there, but all of a sudden his performance is spiked. When Pippen came back, he felt like he was no longer needed. Mm. It tipped again. So these documentaries, the content's always out there, but we have to be willing to see it and see what's beneath that. Also, what I really enjoyed was when, <laughs> When Red Rodman went to Vegas and <laughs> I just didn't come back. But again, links to football. We talk about Sir Alex Ferguson, hair dryer, you know, he shouts, he's a disciplinarian. Well, actually, not with Cantona. Um, Cantona will turn up late. Um, he didn't, and he would wear his own attire. He didn't wear club attire. So, what we see is the flexibility when acknowledging actually some players, if we constrain them and make them fit in with everybody else, we could lose the player. So Alex Ferguson was very aware of that. So that's why he didn't do that with Cantona. Phil Jackson was aware of that with Rodman. That's why he allowed that to happen. And this is where we look at boundaries and saying, and this is the challenge for a coach, knowing when to stretch those boundaries and also seeing the risk that comes with it, not just for the player, but also for the team, because Roy Keane questioned what Alex Ferguson done. And Ryan Giggs, I actually saw an interview, I should have saved it. The Ryan Giggs said, look, the gaffer made himself vulnerable there because if it didn't work, if it didn't pay off with Cantona, you know, he may have lost the team. So, yeah, I, I, I love the Jordan Doc. So, on that topic of, yeah, like, let, let's, let's Rodman go and Jordan probably, you know, shows up in a cigar the odd time as well. So, he's treated differently as well. Um, so, how do you then transfer that to not even, like, youth level – even an amateur level where your players, you know, you mentioned before this great balance between humility and arrogance. Some just coaches, they're not allowed or we're not allowed to say, listen, she's the best player on the team. She's going to get a little bit more rope or he's going to get a little bit more rope. So how do you balance that? Like treating people differently without, again, it'll be labeled as favoritism in a different context by other players. I mean, how do you maneuver around that? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, but the players do it themselves. Right. As I said, we all played at a level where, you know, when we're struggling, we're going to look for that one player to give the ball to, you know. So the players do it themselves. And I will always say to the coaches is give the responsibility to the team. You know, you set up, okay, so, you know, guys, and I'm not saying to do it this directly, but, okay, you know, what's the most effective way for us to play? Get their feedback and, you know, who do you think is the outlet? Also, when the pressure's on us, who are the ones that step up? And this isn't a judgment. I'm not, you can say, I'm not saying, oh, you know, they're better because they do this. But it's something for you to explore because when you explore why that you may hide or not step up, you can deal with that. And actually, because you deal with the route, then you can be another one that steps up. And so it's not so much that person being the best person, but player, but it's looking at what they are doing to be the most effective, whether it be in that time or overall. Because then what happens is when you frame it that way, you empower the other players. And that's why the dialogue is so important to be had in terms of the emotion. Because the, the technical aspect takes care of itself. And um, the emotional aspect actually controls that as well. You know, so when you explore that, the players can be like, actually, yeah, I can do that. Or, or why am I hiding? Or why am I doing that? Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's just a game of running emotions. As I said, physically, they will, they can pretty much all do the same thing, you know? Mm. Uh, Jonas has asked about the, the behaviours of a coach the training session. Can that impact the emotional level? say maybe too too hands on or or too laid back is there a balance that you you should look together is that dependent on the stage it's yes yeah, it's, it's the balance is tough i know and I, I always say this listen you guys have one of the toughest jobs in the world because you have to try and do what you think's best while consistently evaluating the environment and moving with it and changing with it i mean i had a i had a, funny enough i had a talk with um the lady at crystal palace i think she's head of welfare she used to be a teacher and we were talking about teaching in class in school where you do a lesson plan, but you have to, you, it has to be um, malleable because if you're rigid to it, then it doesn't work and you lose people. So I think for the coach, it's like, okay, this is how I'm going to set up. This is what I'm going to do. I said, like, okay, how can I be flexible to move consistently? 
Now, the reason why it's difficult is because, yes, you have to assess to, to be flexible to the environment, but you also have to question yourself and what you're doing and, and your capabilities. You know, we spoke about reading and developing, doing courses, because it's not it's not an easy task. And I'll tell you what, from experience, it's, it's very frustrating. I find it so frustrating because you start to realize the mistakes that you make. You start to get annoyed because you're asking yourself what you've done. Is it the right thing? And, you know, you're constantly going through that. After a while, you get used to it, to be honest. But um, I, I, I would say it's just about, okay, being as flexible as you can, being vulnerable. You need people around you who are going to be honest. If you're going to have other coaches around you who are just going to tell you what you want to hear or tiptoe around you, I think it, it kind of stunts your growth. You know, when I wrote psychology, I, I so I've got friends who are authors, I've got I know teachers and all these people who are qualified in literacy, all these different levels. I sought advice from one of my best friends. He was a footballer because I knew that he would give me his raw, unapologetic feedback. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was priceless. And and even when I had done the book, I spoke to my friend who's like a bestseller, like he's an unbelievable author. But he tiptoed around giving me the feedback and then at a push, he gave me a, like a minor criticism. You know, so it's about who are you, who's your circle? And cre- they don't have to be in your team, but people that you can reach out to and say, this is what I've done. And they say, well, look, you know, I don't think you should have done that. And they might not be right, but it, it just encourages your thinking. I think you should have done this. And these are the reasons as to why. And that stretches you. You might disagree, but now you've, you've got other um, ways of thinking. You're more dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, last couple. Uh, Adam, any advice on getting parents to buy in on the mental side of the game? It seems like many think we should just be focused on the technical work. Yeah, well, the thing is with the parents is, um, and that's the coach's job to educate them. And, and, and this is why I say, again, I go back, being a coach is so difficult because when you take a young player, you're actually working with a family. You know, mm-hmm. so um, it's about having those conversations with a parent. So I, I will say, look, and everything I say isn't right. It's just the way that I see it. And this is really important because I think sometimes we give too much power to people who might have a platform or just because I played or wrote a book. What I say isn't right. It's just me saying what I think. But if I were to have a team, one of the things I would do is also have a meeting with the parent again, explaining how I work, how I would do things. And so actually they get an understanding of it. Um, because otherwise, they're just going to bring their, you know, their thoughts and processes from before, and rightly so. So it's just about educating them so they can understand. And then if they do challenge what you say, that's fine. But it's for them you to have a conversation and then stress test what's going on here. Because then, because you know more depth, then at the end of the day, they they'll be they would they don't want to be ignorant by choice. They'll be like, oh, actually, it's got a point here. So I would say, literally, have the conversation with the parents. Right. Okay, last one from uh, from Greg. I didn't know he was on this call. So Greg from the Scottish FA. Uh, mm-hmm. I've heard a few people recently adopt the phrase "change the people" or "change or change the people" or "change." I've misread this, or I think it's "change the environment" or "change the people." I'm not sure this statement sits well with me. what's your take on it. Um, I've misread this. What is there is a phrase. Something, something, or change the people. Um, I okay. Know. I mean, to be honest with you, I think one of the best metaphors for this is um, of agriculture. So when you look at farmers, you know, when they grow their crops, it's not about judging the crop. It's about creating the best environment for the, the crop to flourish. So with players, it's the same way. I mean, again, I, as I said, I'm, when I was playing the worst, and that was because of my coach, and then obviously I took it upon myself and was like, okay, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be the best that I could be. Um, and again, I worked at an under 23s at a Premier Club, Premier League club last year with the under 23s. And out of 20 players, 17 said they're not playing at their best. And the reasons were because of their coach. So their environment was the reason why they weren't playing well. You know, and, and again, going back to psychology, when I speak to people that work with Mourinho, they all spoke about what he'd done away from football. Um, he's fine detail, so you know what? They didn't need to think about anything else. The fact that he made it inclusive, he literally used to hammer his assistants, so they thought, oh my God, we are all one team. The fact that he ran Benny McCarthy's mum, he didn't need to do that. The list goes on and on and on. It was things he did away from football, and that's part of the environment. Are you going to bite? Are you going to coach me? 
strategies, um, tactics is one part of coaching. But when we look at coaching in other environments, it's the same meaning. It's about motivation as well. It's about adhering to the individual. Yeah, the, the phrase is change the people or change the people. Um, I've never heard that one before. That's, that's interesting. So, hey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, as I said, I think when you look at environments, I, I can't I can't stress enough how important it is. Is and and oh and this is what I love again. When you look at Alex Ferguson at Man United, no one spoke about him as a coach. You know, he's one of the best managers. And when we talk about managers, remember they are coaching. A lot of them are coaching. I know some don't. But the reason being is because he created an environment. And that was why, I mean, in his book Leadership, oh that's another one to recommend. I'm it was really good. He spoke about Archie Knox handing in his notice. And he was like, why are you leaving? He said, well, you don't need me here because you're doing everything. Mm -hmm. And what Alex Ferguson said was that after that, he then took a bird's eye approach. So he stepped back. But why this was so powerful was because then he can now see the mechanics of everything and adjust it. So he empowered his coach, but he could also see the bigger picture. So then why he could last so long was because he could bring people in and always fine tune. So then when you look at someone like Arsene Wenger, he was doing everything. But the problem with Arsene Wenger is he couldn't see the, the bird's eye view. So when, other, when you look at other clubs now tapping into the French market um, and, and literally his time, I mean, we, we could say every coach has their time. But the reason why he couldn't adjust is because he couldn't see the bird's eye view. He was literally on the floor. And, then, and so because of that, the environment was the same. Whereas Sir Alex, he was always changing, always changing, always tweaking, you know? Where do you speak with this story? Where do you think Mourinho was so good at it, and now is apparently not like that? He was so relationship based, and now you hear so many struggles with it. Is do you think it's this? It's the age gap. Do you think it's the ability of the players? Is it momentum? I mean, what, there's so many things to this. What do you think? I think part of it is ego, and the reason why I say that is. I think Mourinho has been absolutely phenomenal. What he achieved so quickly is unbelievable. But I, I think, I believe everything in life has a plus and a negative, and I mean everything. So I think because he's had that, I think he became fixed. And then when you struggle, it's hard to see alternative ways to do something. And then so what he done is he ended up maybe taking out on the players. And so when he went back to Chelsea for his second stint, you know, he had that situation when he brought Matic on and took him off which is quite difficult and he never managed it right. Um, and I think then, I think John Terry might have said something about him. I think, he, you know, he, he dropped Terry and he literally imploded. And, and I think he struggled to adapt. But I think he's come full circle because he did the same thing with Eric Dyer, and he took it upon himself to apologise to Dyer, And he even um, spoke about it in his interview post-game, you know, saying, look, I'm sorry I had to do it to Dyer. I've apologised to him. So he'd managed it completely differently. Now, again, everyone runs their time. So I think he's, he's improved, but maybe it's Klopp's era now, you know? So that's what's happened. Now it's a, it's a new era. And, and going back to Sir Alex Ferguson, I think the difference between him and these coaches is that he created an environment. So I think Klopp has been amazing, but then there's going to be a time where another coach takes over. Whereas at Man United, I think the difference was that the environment breeded generals. You know, when you look at the types of players they had, and I believe this, but I saw Rio do a talk on it the other day, and he said, if Alex Ferguson wasn't there for a while, the team would actually function by itself. You know, when he left, the reason why it, it imploded was, you know, the team had won the league, but I think David Moyes, I think he came with the old school mentality. I remember back in the day, when a new coach come in, they would, they would change the system, and they'll say people weren't fit enough, and they wanted to put their stamp on it. And so with David Moyes, I know he got rid of Rene Moudenstein, he got rid of some of the other coaches. He done all these changes, and and I feel that he lost the culture. He he split up the first team in the academy used to eat together. He then split that up. Everything about United was about family and unity. So when I spoke about, to Karen Richardson about his time at United, he highlighted the fact of training next to the first team, even when he wasn't in it. He spoke about those connections. When I spoke to the players at United, they spoke about these things. David Moyes came in and just done that. So when we look at environment, it's these small things. It's not about a um, hairdryer. And, and a lot of people, I've never heard a club where they spoke about the receptionist lady and the kit woman so much in my life. You know, 
environment. I can go about, I can go on about this forever and a day. So it's these other elements have nothing to do with football. When I watched the soccer box with Gary Neville and Scholes, and uh, Neville said, why do you think Ferguson never went after Mourinho, that like, he went after Wenger and he went after Rafa? Uh, and the two of them kind of just agreed that he knew that they couldn't beat them. So he knew that, you know, you said they'll have their time and a coach can be, they can be the chief whenever you're winning the games. But he... He left. He let Mourinho have it for a couple of years because he knew he didn't have the the horses to get after them. I just thought it was like mm. again little things, you know, little like he changed by he he wasn't the boss in the media room. He didn't play mind games with Jose because he knew he couldn't he couldn't take on that, that fight on the pitch. And it, uh, that's the level that those guys operate at. It's it's a serious level of awareness. Yeah, um, I mean, touching on that, it's just going on about Mourinho. I think. I think football coaches, I think, I think they're like teachers in a way. And I think society should probably start seeing them that way, like football teachers. Because when you look at, say, the Mourinho, Mourinho's of this world, the, the fine detail that that man goes into in his training is so real. And I, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because when people are talking about courses and books, I think if you adopt this mentality of being almost like a teacher, is you will always look to study and develop outside of football. And I think everything will fall into place. So that's the attitude I would definitely say is to literally find your path and, and study. When I first started, started to, um, to, when I was first a therapist and I started to study, I was going to people who were who had all this experience and asking them advice. But then it got to a stage when I realized my path and where I'm going. So now I don't ask any advice because I know, okay, I'm going to probably study neuroscience and neuropsychology. And these are the reasons why. This is the avenue I'm going now. So it's about doing these courses and finding your identity because you, you're now evolving. So now as a coach, you've, you know, you've done your badges. Now you've evolved and now looking at other aspects. Now it's finding your journey in that other space. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Kevin, we're out of time. Thank you so much. A couple of people are on there about the book. So I think uh, they're going to go. That. Um, really appreciate you coming on and best of luck during this time. And hopefully we'll be again soon. Pleasure, absolute ple pleasure, man. And good work, Gary, man. I love it. Great stuff. Thanks, Kevin. Soon. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you. Bye, bye. Bye. All right.